At last Kel came to the first arcade and pushed his way through it, back through the noise and the stench of vinegar and the gambling crowds, until finally he could see the archway and the entrance to the pier. Rosie was standing to one side, waiting for Khan. You okay? Kel asked her. He was starved of air, cursing the cigarettes he had smoked, the years he had lived, the distance he had run in fierce summer heat. He took off the rucksack and had to lean against the side of a fish and chip stall, trying to catch his breath. Rosie looked as if she had never seen a man in such a state of exhaustion. I'm all right, she replied. How about you? There were still large numbers of people milling around the entrance to the pier. Some had come up from the beach, others were holding buckets and windbreaks, heading down to the sand for an evening swim. Kel continued to search the crowds for Khan. The sound system was still playing Michael Jackson as seagulls squawked overhead. Drawing in a series of deep breaths, Kel looked at Rosie and handed back her phone. Don't trust me not to call him, did you? Never crossed my mind, Kel replied. She was scanning the faces in front of her, eyes scrutinizing everything in her path. No sign of him, she said, but as Kel looked down at his watch, he heard a note change in Rosie's voice, as if all the strength had suddenly left her. Oh God, she said, he's here. I can see him. He's coming from the road. Uh, Divide Us By is the third part of a trilogy about Thomas Kell, a disgraced MI6 officer who, in this novel, has a chance to exact revenge against the Russian SVR officer who he blames for the death of his girlfriend. Um, but it's a sort of two-part story. On the one hand, there is Kell and his counterpart, his Russian counterpart, going head-to-head -head in a sort of battle of wills. And then the other, his Russian counterpart, has information about a possible terrorist attack in the UK, which Kell is keen to extract from him, but cannot necessarily know if it's true or not. There, were, there was a lot of ideas at work, but the, but the principal thing I wanted to do was to look at the jihadist mindset, what, understand why it is that young men, particularly young men, sometimes young women, are going from the UK to places like Syria and being brainwashed effectively by ISIL and coming back to the UK and increasingly to places like France and Germany and so forth um, with the desire of wreaking havoc and destruction on their own people, effectively. Why, why is that happening? Um, and what would motivate a middle-class, well-educated young boy from, say, Leeds to do that? So Shahid Khan is one of the main characters in The Divide Us By, and I was trying to understand what was motivating him. Um, other than that, it was a, a chance to round off the, the that's what I saw it, the, the Kell story as a, as a trilogy of books, A Foreign Country, A Cold War, and A Divided Spy, although hopefully a Divided Spy can be read, I think it can, as a standalone. Uh, in terms of research, the most interesting thing was th th this looking at the jihadist mindset, why, why it is that, that, that young men are um, choosing this, this, this path of, of, of self-annihilation and the destruction of potentially hundreds of thousands of other people. And a lot of it was to do with uh, a, a lack of self-worth. It very, very um, irregularly has anything to do with Islam or religion of any kind. It's much more to do with uh, kind of self-aggrandizement, a sense of belonging to something and being uh, powerful and significant. Um, that was the thing that I found most interesting in, in researching the book. So Kel, when you first see Kel in a foreign country, is a man who has been excluded from the, from the service. He's been he's been turfed out for what he believes are uh, false reasons that he's been he's been set up. He's the kind of fall guy for uh, the service, so that the service can continue and find somebody to blame for uh, the rendition and I illegal torture of a British subject who's been held in captivity in, in the Middle East. Um, but he is extremely useful to the service and extremely good at his job. And so what he's seeking all the time is uh, a sense of redemption and also to get himself back into the service so that he can t continue to do good good work. But as the trilogy progresses, he finds it almost impossible to trust the people who are giving him instruction. And I think he's gradually sort of eroded by the experience of being a middle-aged intelligence officer and, and the constant lying and obfuscation and uh, deceit and the, and the inability to trust anybody who he, even his sort of close friends. And so um, a divided spy really is about Kel making a choice as whether to, to continue to be an intelligence officer, to continue to be a spy, or at a fairly late stage in his life to call an end to it and start again effectively. Kel is partly inspired by somebody that I knew in that world who uh, works in that world who was somebody I'd spent a lot of time with and had seen both sort of professionally and uh, socially um, kind of a good deal. And I was fascinated by him as a, a person and, and wanted to sort of drill down into not just how he 
might behave professionally, but also what he was like as a just as a, a, a normal everyday human being. I've always been trying to get away from a sort of a James Bond, Jason Bourne attitude to spying, and to see that these are sort of real people with real lives, families, children, um, aspirations, and frailties. Um, but there's a lot of me in Kel, no question about it, and probably has been there's been more of Kel in certainly in Cold War and Divided Spy, um, more of me and Kel in Cold War and Divided Spy. Um, at, towards the end of the trilogy. Um, the character of Manasian, who's the, the Russian SBR officer in Divided Spy, is also inspired partly by somebody that I knew. Um, and I was very interested to get down on the page what you could sort of generally call a sort of sociopathic mindset, i.e. somebody who is extremely charming, extremely intelligent, extremely capable, but completely ruthless and uh, without um, uh, any kind of moral center or sort of moral code. Um, so those were really the two principal inspirations. Uh, did I have any personal experience with MI6? I, I did. A long time ago, I was interviewed by them um, when I was 25 for a job which I didn't get. Um, I think there's a, people believe that I work for them and can't possibly talk about it, but I really didn't work for them and, and can talk about that. Um, but it certainly inspired me to, to write A Spy by Nature, my first book, which was sort of semi-autobiographical account of the, certainly the interview process and the exam process. Um, and since then, I've just become increasingly fascinated by that world and by the people who work in it and how they are affected both sort of politically and socially and, and, and um, in human terms by, by, by the impact of working in that world. So my books, are I try, they, I try to make them more realistic than uh, fantastical, if that makes sense. How, how do I keep the novels fast-paced and exciting? Um, I have tried... Uh, since really, uh, I would say, Typhoon, my fourth book, to make the books, I've consciously tried to make them more exciting and more page-turning because I think my early books were quite sort of Marmite novels. Some people really loved them, but there wasn't necessarily an awful lot of activity. There was quite a lot of talk and quite a lot of uh, theorising. But but the, um, in terms of, I think, my um, dramatic uh, talent needed honing. Um, so uh, I've definitely tried to make more stuff happen and try to ramp up the suspense in the last few books and the trick has always been to, to have that to keep people turning the pages but also to to, to make them um, interesting socially and, and politically and, and, and emotionally complex so if I can get the balance right between what you could sort of loosely call entertainment and seriousness then I've done my job well. Uh, my own favorite spy novels obviously would be from you know Le Carre is the master so I'm a huge admirer of his uh, the Spy Came In From The Cold and Tinker Taylor. I, I think Smiley's People is possibly his best book. Well, The Russia House. I mean, I, I'm, he, he, can, he can't do much wrong in my eyes. Um, Eric Ambler is a sort of less well-known spy novelist but was hugely popular and successful in the um, early part of the 20th century. He, but he wrote novels from uh, the point of view of somebody who's sort of outside the intelligence services. So he would have an ordinary man who was plunged into extraordinary circumstances and he'd have to sort of live and survive on his wits. Um, Otherwise, I'm a big Bond fan, but I wouldn't say they've necessarily influenced my writing particularly. Um, but no, but principally Le Carre, Graham Greene, but you can really call Graham Greene a spy novelist, but, but something of the atmosphere of Greene has, has been very important. Uh, what do I enjoy most about writing? I would say probably not writing is the most enjoyable thing about what I do. <laughs> so uh, research, um, uh, uh, just not being at my desk trying to sort of force sentences out of me. I do find it quite difficult. I, I think the end result when I have the kind of book in my hand, I feel very proud and I, I love that sort of six month, eight month period after a book comes out where people are sort of reacting to it and telling you, the, you know, that they liked it or if they have a criticism and you just having that conversation, feeling that you've um, had an, an effect on somebody and that they've in, enjoyed the book or want to discuss the book, that's, that's a great feeling. But actually the process of writing, I try to avoid it as much as I can, it's, it's tough. But it, I'm not complaining, but I find it difficult.